Hey, thank you so much. Hey. For We're so excited. Again, everyone, my name is Laquanda Roberts Buckley. I am the Director of Outreach for Mental Health America, and we are here with the wonderful Shante Atkins. We uh, hey. connected with her um, for our conference. She was a very uh, inspirational uh, individual for us, and she came out. She sung beautifully at our, at our Clipper Beers Awards Center. Um, and we are so grateful to have her on this this afternoon to discuss, you know, more in depth and the, the in depth of our identity. And so, Shantae, I'll just give you an opportunity to just share with everyone a little bit about who you are, and we can mm -hmm. dive into the conversation. Absolutely. I just want to make sure you can hear me good. Yes, we can hear you. We can okay. hear you. Okay. Um, so I um, let's see. I was raised in a huge family. Um, I'm the youngest of nine children. And um, I sing, I do lots of things. I worked in the mental health field uh, for about eight years, eight or nine years, close to nine years um, with so many different people. It was an amazing experience. I learned so much prior to even working in the mental health field. I was constantly coming in contact with people who were either um, extremely depressed or suicidal. And so at the age of 17, I, um, when I went to college, I had all these people who were battling all these things and I was just trying to help. I was just trying to talk to them, try to, you know, do whatever I could. And I didn't have any information about mental health or anything like that. So I just kind of talked to people. I ended up battling some things myself. And so I just have a love for, um, you know, just the whole idea of mental health. Um, and yeah, that's it. Okay. And just for anyone who's tuning in, just to let you know, uh, we will be talking about discussions on depression, anxiety, um, maybe some suicidal. So if you're having any of those, those thoughts ideal, be sure to text seven, MHA to 741-741 um, to be connected with a crisis counselor. So can you put I that in the comments, the information? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. And we can pin the comment so that the people can see it. As they come in. So, and I have someone in the background. Where did you go? There you go, Sensei. Okay. To do that for me. And so, um, one thing is that I, we were talking about this month, and you joined this conversation in depth of our um, depth of my identity. So, when it comes to our identity, they're not just, um, you know. Their focus is on our views, but also the views of how other people have seen us in the past. And when it comes to marginalized communities, then sometimes those views can be um, seen as negative, and we have to constantly fight back against those things. And Absolutely. so this, as part of our campaign, we ask people three general questions. What labels would you um, use to describe yourself? How would, excuse me, how have the perceptions of others impact you and your mental health? And what advice would you give to others to protect their well-being and overall mental health as if they encounter similar challenges? Mm -hmm. And I have your responses here. Um, and mm -hmm. I want to go through that, but I want to go a little bit more in depth in some things. For how you describe yourself, you said you're a black female heterosexual minister, a strong friend, loyal, spontaneous, witty, but you also put emotional. And that, yeah. next, that, 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 that stuck out to me because usually when we describe ourselves, we're, you know, we're describing, you know, things that everybody is like, oh, this is so perky and, you know, mm -hmm. you put emotional. So when you were describing yourself, what, what led you to want to include that, that impact? Well, because I am like, I just, I don't know how people view things, but I, for me, I just believe that women were more emotional. We're more in tune with our emotions, the emotions of others. And I think that there's so much stigma uh, surrounding being emotional or quote unquote, emotionally unstable. And for me, I'm an emotional being. And I, I didn't always, I wasn't always okay with that. I used to be the quote unquote, most non-emotional person, but really it wasn't that. It was just certain emotions that I was okay with expressing. So it would be either anger or extreme excitement. It was, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't even allow myself or even know how to allow, how to um, communicate or even allow myself to feel those things. And it wasn't until um, I started working in the mental health field that I, um, you know, felt like, oh, it's actually okay to feel. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's okay to feel. So for me, that piece about me being emotional, I am. And I don't view that as a negative. I think that it's something very, you know, great that I can be in tune with my own emotions and the emotions of others. 
So moving on, it says, how have the perceptions of others impacted your, your mental health? And I really want to read what you wrote because this, I thought this was, had, has some very interesting points. It says, on mm -hmm. one hand, the perceptions of others have made me feel shame and embarrassed for having mental health concerns and receiving care. On the other hand, I've received a lot of support from others to get the help that I need and to use my voice and platform to speak out about it. I feel as if I, if I were Caucasian and not a Christian, some people would be more accepting of my journey to being mentally and emotionally healthy. So there's a couple of things in there that I want to pull out because it seems like when you were speaking, you were speaking of that double-edged sword that yeah. a lot of people who deal with mental health concerns deal with is, you know, you, you have that, that internal shame that this is even taking place at all. That, you know, sometimes you feel like I should be stronger. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. how it goes. The, yeah, as girl. As the, the black woman, we, we have to have yeah. our, our stuff together. We yeah. We strong all the time. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, when we're not able to meet those, whoever those expectations are, whether they're internally or externally, mm -hmm. then, you know, that, that, that shame comes in. But on the other side, it's that part that we experience where people are saying or commending us yeah, for, yeah. Um, for moving forward and for speaking about the things that are going on. And so my question to you is how do you move past, or if someone is in that position, how do you move past that shame and, and that in, in embarrassment feeling to get to that point to where, you know, you can utilize platforms where you can you know speak your truth where you can feel mm -hmm. a proud and saying that you know i you know address my mental health concerns mm -hmm. and i get the care that i need for them well for me um honestly it, it was a few things the first thing is my faith in jesus i said that you know i was a woman of faith and that's something that i boldly declare um because even with all of my difficulties and you know what I mean situations that I've gone through and, and what I've experienced as it pertains to um the health of my emotions and, and my mind um I think that I, I I believe that my faith in Jesus Christ is what caused me to say hey you know what all of this stuff I'm telling other people all of these things you know what I mean that I'm encouraging other people to do and talk about or whatever I have to do that first like the message comes to me, you know, I believe that the message should go to me first before it goes to other people. So um, that helped me also working in the mental health field, like literally working with other people who saw that this was, um, am I not supposed to be saying, talking? No, no, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go on, sorry. I was like, you talking to me, girl, or somebody else? <laughs> um, so for me, I... I um I worked in the mental health field and so you know people they're more open and receptive and so I had friends who were you know um therapists and all of that so I would say that those things helped me I hope that I'm answering your question if not you can ask me again and I will give you a better answer <laughs> no I think you did okay. an excellent job in responding <laughs> to the question so could you tell us more about your your mental health um wellness journey um, when you first began to realize that, you know, some things were going on and that you needed some more support. Yeah, so I would say it really began for me in college. I can remember, and I, I totally forgot about this until you asked me this right now. I remember I was on the road singing and traveling uh, with my sisters um, as a background singer and I forget what state we were in and I remember sitting in the bed with my sister um, Erica and I I was like I, I had been reading up on certain stuff and I was like I think I might be a manic depressant like I remember saying that because I now I didn't know I didn't have really a, a lot of knowledge but I just would just I would have these spells where I just would cry uncontrollably and I could not stop right mm -hmm. but then I would have you know these things, you know, multiple thoughts at one time. And so people call it hearing voices, but I wasn't hearing audible voices. It would just be, I would be bombarded with all these thoughts. Didn't know where they were coming from. Didn't know how to handle it. Didn't know. And I'm just like, what is going on with me? Then the same things that the people were dealing with that I was helping, I started dealing with that. Now I'm like, well, maybe I need to die. Or maybe, you know what I mean? Now, the first time I had suicidal ideations, I remember I was 12 years old and I remember taking, um, 
a bottle of pills, but I just kind of, that didn't work. I was like, oh, okay, that didn't work. So, you know, I kept going on. At this point, I'm in college. Mm-hmm. At this point, when I'm going through, so, so during the summers in college, that's when I would sing. So I remember, uh, you know, seeing, just speaking out about it. So I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go talk to a therapist or I'm going to talk to a counselor. But I knew, I was able to identify something is wrong here. Something else is going on. Yeah, I may have a big personality or maybe gifted and all that, but something else is going on here. I don't really know how to address it, but just having the conversation, you know, was helpful. Now, the first time I actually uh, talked to a therapist or counselor was when I worked at a residential treatment facility and they talk, talked about self-care. Um, and and that's when I began, you know, talking to people who were like, you know, uh, licensed and all of that. And so they gave me, you know, just different things. I never really um, was consistent with one person. I would just talk to multiple therapists. Like, it, mm-hmm. it, I was mine was more spontaneous. When I feel it, I got to talk about it. You know what I'm saying? And so that's when I begin to really seek out more for my, more help for myself. Yeah. I know um, when I was listening to your, your song, God Sees, in the, in, and you look at the video, the, the very beginning, it's like this plea. Um, mm-hmm. And not, not just a plea, but this, this, this almost a letter of encouragement, yeah. of, of a spoken, spoken word of encouragement to people. Where where were you in that in that space when you began Ooh. to to speak those words? Because it it, it was it, it was an emotional it, it was, was an emotional space, and I could sense that emotion yeah. while you were speaking it. And um, to have that in front of your video, um, I just really wanted to just open up a little bit of you know where was that that space, and and how were you able to to bring that into um, God's feet? So that actually came before God sees you that that came before there was a song, before there was a lyric, before there was a melody. I was going through so much at that time. I, um, I had gone through a breakup. I had lost my father. I had lost three people in one year. Um, I, Yes, so far I, I went out. Um, but I was heartbroken for so many reasons. And I remember I had left out of my friend's house and I forgot we were talking about something. I think that I just had to come to grips with the fact that this particular person that I thought I was going to be with, it wasn't. And it just, I just all that. And then I started thinking about all the people who had died. I thought about my very close friend who had died. He was like a sister to me who did my hair as a child and she had mental health battles. She was, you know, in and out of, you know, psych wards and, you know, just so many different things. And I just felt like people never paid attention to her. And, you know, I just was thinking about, man, we lost a great one. We lost an amazing person. And so I was literally sitting in this car and I just remember I was in the car screaming to the top of my lungs. I was crying. So I I could not stop crying. And when I finally stopped, I was like, I got to, there, I, I have to say something. I have to speak out. There may be somebody else dealing with this. You know, I have to talk about it. And so I sat in this car and I wiped my face and I said, you know, like, you know, I remember working in the residential treatment facilities and I remember seeing the young girls when it came to holiday time and they didn't have family and they didn't have family that would come visit them and they didn't have these things. So we had to be their family. We had to be their comfort. We had to hold them, you know what I'm saying, when they were screaming like because they had so much so much emotional pain. And mm-hmm. I sat in this car and I just said, give me something to give to these people that will be a, 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 a alarm. You know what I mean? Like a, a alarm, like an ambulance. When, an, when we know it's an emergency, we hear that, that, that sound. So I just wanted to release like a, a sort of an alarm to get uh, the message across to these people. And so it came from that place of me just saying like, man, you know, these people who we have lost to, who have, who have lost, I don't want to say lost the battle, but they, they've gone on. It's mm-hmm. like, it's so tough to deal with those type of things. It's so tough to deal with losing your parent, which I lost my father. It's tough to deal with these things. But if you're dealing with these things, you got to say something. 
You got to say something. You got to talk. You got to get help. You got to know that it's okay for you to speak out. It's okay to say, I'm grieving. I'm hurting. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. I feel like there's no one who can look out for me. I feel like I, I don't, I have no idea how to handle this. I don't know what's wrong with me. I know something's wrong, but I don't know what's wrong. And so that, that video, it came from that place. I was missing my, you know, my, my sister so much. And she wasn't my blood sister, but she was a sister to me. She had done so much for me. And I'm just like, how did we not see this? We've lost yet another one because we're not paying attention in mm -hmm. the church community, not paying attention. Oh, you're a Christian. You shouldn't go through this. You shouldn't be having this problem. And so it came from that place. No, I don't care what your position is, what position you hold, who you are to other people. If you're the strong person, if you're the weak person, whoever you are, know that it is okay for you to speak out. Know that it is okay for you to get help. Know that it is okay for you to say no. Know that it is okay for you to seek and get the resources that you need so that you you can be mentally whole so that you can be emotionally whole. And I, and it really just came from that place because there were so many things happening at that time. I know I went in, but I'm going to come yeah. down. <laughs> but I'm really, you know, I, it's a very yeah. serious thing for me. Yeah. That's and I wanted, I wanted, um, you gave me exactly what I was looking for. Cause when I, when mm -hmm. I, when I, um, looked at that, I wanted to know where, where that space was. Yeah. Um, cause it was a, it was a very powerful position that you were that you were taking and you were standing in in that moment and i wanted to ask you also as you were moving through your journey and you were finding yourself um seeking help and and taking care of yourself how was your family responding to you how did they respond to your journey in the beginning so everybody responded i think differently I think that it was just, you know, they were accustomed accustomed to me having these, um, I'll just call emotional like kind of breakdowns. And what I mean by that is I would be, I would feel the, the pain and things that people would be going through, right? Mm -hmm. And I would be crying, my face would be swollen, all this, and it'd be like, Shantae, what's wrong? You know what I'm saying? What's going on? And they didn't understand. And they were like, are you depressed? Are you, you know, they didn't really know how, they didn't have the language to yeah. you know identify what was going on but they knew it was something and so you know when I decided to check myself into the mental health hospital um after leaving a prayer meeting at a church um I had my friend with me and she was like you know you don't need you know you don't need to go here and so I was walking up and I was walking back and I was walking up and I was walking back like I need to go but I don't know and I need to it, it was this back and forth thing right and so um that person she drove me there and I told her I need you to drive me to the mental health hospital something is wrong i need help right so this is my friend my very close friend my family was not involved in that part now i had just come from a family member's church and i feel like they did all that they could do they did all that they could do right mm -hmm. i need to really sit and talk to somebody who kind of understood my mind frame understood what i was feeling and and not just be able to relate with that but be able to to, to bring a certain normalcy you know what I mean? To what I was uh -huh. feeling so that I know this is things that people go through. You know, it yeah. doesn't mean that you're some, you know, psycho, you know, because you're feeling this or you're seeing this or you're having these, you know what I mean? Overwhelming thoughts or, 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 or you're feeling these overwhelming things or you see a, a presence or you see these things that you don't know if they're spirits, they're demons, they're ghosts, they're, you don't know what are you, you have all these things you don't know how to identify. And so for me during that process, I think that once my family found out that I was in the mental health hospital, there was two people that I called. One was my nephew, um, and I, uh, and one was a woman who, uh, she's like a, a prophet. And I remember calling her, and she made me feel so comforted and so safe and just did not judge me. She mm -hmm. said, you just need rest, and you just need a little help. And I just, I think back to that because I'm just like, if I didn't have that, that support that I needed at that time, I probably wouldn't have went, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it may not be for you to get, you know, um, on pills or whatever. Sometimes you just need to release your heart and you need to talk. And um, you need to know that somebody else cares that what you're going through is, is really meaningful to them. And it's not like, oh, here she goes again. But mm -hmm. you need to know that somebody hears you. You need to know that somebody cares. You need to know that somebody understands this is the help that I need. 
for me right now. You know what I'm saying? And so um, that woman, like I'm, I'm so appreci appreciative of her. her name is Mary Hobbs. I'm so appreciative of her because she did not make me feel ostracized. She did not make me feel anything. I think that my family wanted to help, but they didn't really know how. So they did what they could. They prayed. You know what I'm saying? They, you know, they tried to just say, you know, I love you. My sister Google, she let me just lay on her couch and I pray all the time. And so she just let me pray on the couch as loud as I needed to. I remember when my father had died and it had just been a month. Um, I remember it had just been a month and I'm sorry that I'm crying, but it had been a month since he had passed and I got in my car because I said I was going to drive to go get all of my things from him and I, I couldn't even drive I was in this car and I was screaming and hollering to the top of my lungs and I, I couldn't even I couldn't even gather myself I had no strength I fell out of my car I literally blacked out I guess I was just crying and crying and crying I was on the floor like my dad is really gone he's really gone I look up and all of a sudden um you know, all these people are surrounding me and they have tissue and they have cards and they're like, are you okay? So, and my sister, she was like, she didn't know. She just heard somebody crying. She came down there. She got me, let me lay on her couch. She made me some food and just let me lay there. And I laid there for about three days, not knowing like, you know, how am I going to get past this? How am I going to overcome this grief? How am I going to overcome this situation? And she just allowed me to lay there. And just, you know, do whatever and talk and share. And, you know, she didn't really know exactly the words to say, but she was there. And sometimes that's, you just need somebody to sit there while you cry and hold your hand or hug you or, you know, or say it's okay to feel what you're feeling. Um, and I needed that in those moments. And so I believe that God strategically placed the people that I needed in those moments to make me feel safe because a lot of people don't feel safe in this world that we live in and I when I tell you I did not feel safe with all the killing that's going on with all the stuff that I was going through in my personal life it was just a lot and I'm a feeler like I can literally feel people's pain I can literally feel it and when you have that, sometimes people, if they don't have that gift, because it is a gift, if they don't have that, then they think something is wrong with you. So then they put more of these labels all over you because you see things and you hear things that they don't. So they tell you you're crazy because they just don't understand. And so through this whole entire journey, there have been people, I, another woman, her name is Dia Hall. And, um, and she, uh, she was my supervisor at the time. You guys, I would be at work and I would be on the floor underneath my desk crying. That woman did not fire me. She did not write me up. She called my sister and she said, Shantae needs your help right now. And at that time, it was my sister, Erica. And I really feel like certain my sisters are like angels on earth, you know? All of them may, know, may not know exactly what to do at the time. At the time. But she came and she said, are you okay? And she took me to her house and, you know, cooked me some food. I got to leave work. But, you know, even um, my my employer, she was so, you know, just sensitive to that. She didn't ostracize me or demonize me or make me feel like you're this, this, that, and the next. Like, she was just there and was like, I'm not going to let you know, go. I know that you're, I know that you're going through. I know that you just lost your dad. And so she was so um just compassionate. And so I appreciate the compassion that people have shown me through my mm -hmm. journey. And it's made me be more compassionate to other people. I don't care what you've been diagnosed with. I don't care. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to care for you. I'm still going to do what I can to help you. If you need the shirt off my back and I got another one, I'm going to give you that. Or I'm going to cut my shirt in half and be like, look, you're going to have half a shirt. I'm going to have half a shirt. And we're going to keep it pushing. You know what I'm saying? And I think mm -hmm. that when we go through things like this, it gives us the opportunity to see that there are people who care. There are people who will be compassionate. There are people who will be mindful of your mental health and know that just like if I came in here and my arm was cut off, you would take that seriously. They will take mental and emotional health seriously, you know, and because I'm a, I, I, I believe that that gift of feeling things comes from uh, interceding for people, meaning praying for people. So as I pray for people, sometimes God allows me to feel what they're going through. And I'm just like, uh, but that causes me to be more compassionate because I can identify with what they're feeling. You know? I, yeah. I think one thing that I love about you is that you have this raw openness that I, I love having here at MHJ as well. Um, and the way that you do what our founder does, is, which is fight in the open. 
Mm -hmm. Like there's no holding back. Like this is the truth. This yeah. is this is what happened. This is the support that I received to get there. You know, this is what I needed. And being real, I think sometimes when it comes to our mental health journeys, we're not real enough with people about what we've actually gone through. Yeah. And so people continue to isolate themselves. And I loved in your song where you said it's like you're like an internal bleeder. Mm -hmm. You can't see your pain, but it's silently kill, but it can silently kill you. And it's like people aren't being real enough about their experiences. And yeah. so we continue to hide and shield ourselves and continue to think if we're just quiet that somehow it'll go away. But that's not the case. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of us sometimes need, you know, we need to speak about certain things. Yeah. We need to say what's going on in our minds. And we need those non-judgmental people to come in to just be there. And I love the fact that you had people who were willing to just be there yeah. and say, rest. Yeah. Just, just be there and rest. And how mm -hmm. powerful, how powerful that is. And even when you were talking about the arm and, you know, how we talk about before stage four and here in MHA and, and really treating physical illnesses and mental health conditions on the same platform, you yes. know, it's like you're not going to wait until someone is at a point of crisis. You know, if something happens to their arm, you're not going to wait until it's too late. It's like, mm -hmm. let's stop waiting until it's too late. Let's stop yeah. having conversations after, after we've lost someone. Let's start yeah. doing things, you know, now being proactive and preventative. preventative. When, it, when it's coming to, you know, people's lives and the conditions that they're facing, because we should not have to live in shame. Right, because right. Because I manage, I openly manage bipolar 1 disorder. I openly have a history of psychosis. I tell people this all the time, not because I'm looking for a woe is me, because I need you to know that you can too. Yeah. That you can too live. You can too mm -hmm. um, fight in the open. You can too live your life before stage four. You don't yeah. always have to be in a point of crisis. And I right. just love the strength that you're conveying right now. It is so amazing and so mm. beautiful just to hear the things that you have overcome. Mm. You have an amazing spirit and an amazing heart, not just for yourself, but you can see that it radiates, you know, to the lives and touching the lives of others and how many people's lives that you are touching just right now you know, yeah. and speaking your truth and saying who you are and saying those things, even in the midst of the tears. Because those tears water the <sighs> seeds of our strength. Yeah. And they have watered you and watered you and cultivated you. And so when we're talking about, <clears throat> when we're talking about, you know, the conversations that you and I have, you know, we're talking about, you know, marginalized communities. We're talking yeah. about, you know, that, Black folks don't always talk about um, mental health. We talk about when it comes to, to, to church that sometimes that that can be a barrier mm -hmm. for us. You know, religion can be a barrier for a lot of people when mm -hmm. it comes to mental health. And that's mm -hmm. why it's become so important that we are um, that we are focusing on Minority Mental Health Month. And I am so grateful that you allowed yourself to be open and to yeah. share so that we will be able to really show what happens and really connect with people who who look like us and who are concerned and who have concerns and who are who have been marginalized yeah. so that they can feel empowered you know to move forward as well absolutely So if there is anyone online that has any questions for um, for Ms. Shante, I know she just went all the way in <laughs> for us on, 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 on live mm -hmm. today. So what are, Shante, before I let you go, what okay. are some of your la what last thoughts on when it comes to self-care? Um, if you don't take care of you, nobody else will. Yeah. So many people have this mindset of believing that, you know, people are going to treat them the way they want to be treated. No, people are going to treat you the way that you show them how you should be treated. You have to show people 
how to treat you by how you treat yourself. If you're loving to yourself, if you talk well to yourself, like I used to talk to myself horribly. I used to be the most, I used to be so negative about myself. I never said anything good about myself. Everything was bad. Everything was negative. Everything was wrong. If people see that, they're going to follow your lead. You have to take care of you. You have to make sure that you are important. You have to know that you have value. You have worth as a human being. You have value. You have worth as, as a human being. If you believe that, you, you do what you have to do to take care of yourself. And learn to tell people no. Sometimes it's too much for you. I have to learn to tell people no. You know what? I can't pray with you today. I'm sorry. I can't help you today. Not today. Because I have to take time with me. I'm sorry. I can't give you my whole check today. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not giving. It doesn't mean that you're not compassionate. It just says that you place boundaries around yourself so that you make sure that you are going to be able to put yourself in a position to continue on and be strong enough mentally and emotionally to do the things that you need to do. If you never learn how to set those boundaries, then it, people are going to think it's a free-for-all. You know what I mean? And you got to take care of you. If you got to take time and say, hey, I got to go to my therapy appointment. Oh, girl, you don't need that. No, yes, I do. Hey, I need to go just sit at the beach and look at the water. Oh, you don't need that. Let's go do this. No, yes, I do. Because if I don't take care of me, you're not going to take care of me. So. Uh, so just yeah. want to um, thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an amazing, amazing conversation. Thank um, you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your energy, your spirit, just, mm -hmm. just really, really appreciate what you brought to us today. Thank uh, so you. I would like to thank everyone who joined us. I would like to thank everyone who participated throughout